Hi, well, thanks very much um, to everybody for, for joining. Um, this is just going to be a, a sort of short um, half an hour sort of uh, overview of, of the scheme, the SI um, Seacorn funding scheme. Um, I'm going to first of all talk a little bit through the, the way the scheme works operationally, and then Finley's going to give an example of one of the projects that, um, that, that we've undertaken in the past. So Finley is one of our research fellows. And, um, so. <laughs> Uh, so we're recording the meeting as well, just because um, other people might like to um, watch it back afterwards who weren't able to make this particular session. OK, so I'll start off by sharing my screen. OK. Um, can everybody see that OK? Yep. Great, OK. So, um, yeah, a webinar about the um, Seacorn Funding Research Awards Programme that has been open for applications now. Um, so just a quick overview, first of all, about IDSI, um, which you might already be um, aware of, but uh, just in case you're not, then um, it was established in 2018 to focus on the providing a hub um, for data intensive science and AI activity within the university. Um, we're trying to promote new approaches to using data science and AI, and this particular pump priming seed corn funding feeds into that objective. Um, and also, um, the um, INSI is the focus for the university's membership of the Turing University Network. So the, the Turing Institute is the National Institute for Data Science and AI, which the university is a member of. And we uh, liaised with that organisation through INSI. So we have a number of um, research themes, um, which are... Well, we've got about uh, 14 of them at the moment, actually, and uh, the, some of them, the ones that are on this slide, are particularly focused around sort of uh, subject areas, um, sector based type of um, issues. And we try to use these as ways of bringing people together and uh, to talk about specific um, topics, opportunities for funding or other sort of um, ways in which my people might be able to work together from across the university. Um, and then we have another series of research themes, which are more sort of cross-cutting cross themes, um, which uh, relate to a number of different activities across the university in data science and AI. So all, all of these different research themes have got different activities that they that they uh, manage within each of these different thematic areas. So some of them have, say, reading groups, or they might have a, a meeting group that that meets each week or each fortnight to try and um, be that focus for people to come along and to talk together about some of the research that's going on that relates to each of these different areas. So you're very welcome. Anyone's very welcome to join any of these, by the way. And um, if you want to know more, the best way to, to find out is to have a look on the website. If you want any more information that's not on the website, then please get in touch with, with me or with Helen Chapman, who's the Institute um, Administrator. Um, and you can reach us by um, emailing in idsci at exeter.ac.uk. So specifically on the research awards, um, we have this call um, twice a year for research awards. Um, and the aim of it is to develop new ways in which um, data science and AI can be used um, in a research context in novel and different ways. Um, it's a pump priming scheme so that we can, the idea being that we can um, give some funding for a short period of time for a small project that can then lead to some further applications that could be the, the basis of a new research avenue and hopefully some new funding opportunities as well. So the research fellows are employed already by, by IDSI and they are able to offer their time sort of up to 0.5 of their time, FTE, um, for six months and there's also a small amount of money that we can give to each group as well if you particularly need it which is sometimes useful for things like computing costs. So here's a, a quick overview of our research fellows. Finley you've um, just met on the call um, with his that uh, I've given a very short description of some of the sort of data science expertise but it's it, it's not a sort of comprehensive list uh, there's it's just a sort of flavour about of some of the things that they've each been involved with. Um, we have Cedric as well, and we also uh, we also have Charlie. Um, so each each of these different um, different research fellows will take on different projects. 
So what kind of projects are we looking for? Well, they have to be interdisciplinary um, and we are looking for any anything that will be able to use data science and AI approaches to address research challenges across the whole of the university. So it's all the sciences, business, health, arts, humanities. Um, generally, we like to have, well, we need to have two co-eyes and they often, they most of the time come from two different departments. So you might get one that's perhaps from computer science and one that's from biosciences or some whatever split it is it, it, it's not a hard and fast rule about where the um, co-eyes have to come from they just have to come from different sort of uh, perspectives um, and we're not obviously looking for projects that will be, be focused on just performing routine data analysis they have to be more about the innov innovation around the use of data science and AI yeah so um, collaborators um, one of the app um, objectives of of the uh, of the projects is is a, is to have a, some sort of impact as coming out of the projects. As I said before, you know, we're hopefully looking for things like publications and future research projects, but we're also um, looking for impact, and that can sometimes come through the um, external partners that you might have on the call uh, on the uh, projects. Uh, so this can include people like, um, say, the NHS or charities or government organisations or sometimes companies. And it, we, we encourage people to think about um, organisations that might be able to be included, either as part of the project or sometimes as, as more like strategic links, who will be people who might be able to use the outcomes of the project if um, when it comes to its um, culmination. So the aims of the project. Um, is to try and develop a, a new uh, a new pilot, a new data or algorithm to underpin, underpin future applications for funding or publications or impact case studies. We want to see a transfer of skills and knowledge exchange between the applicant team and um, research fellows that can um, offer the opportunity to take the projects forward after the end of the awards. This can include you know, sort of a sharing information at the end, a handover with, say, PhD students or postdocs, so that um, so that the work can be continued. We want to ex establish and expand um, a broader science, data science uh, and AI community in Exeter. Um, we've already got a very vibrant um, community in Exeter in data science and AI, and we'd just like to you know make sure that we're reaching all of the different parts of the university. Um, and then to look at opportunities for new collaborations with our external partners where that is appropriate to do so. So eligibility is a we need two applicants for each project um, it's coming from two different disciplines. If you don't have a collaborator, if you've got an idea, but you, you need a collaborator, then do come to us because we can sometimes help to, to partner you up with other people from across the university that we know are working in that um, related area. Um, the PIs need to be academic members of staff, but PhD students can also be involved in the work. And, and you know, so we don't want to, it's not meant to be, um, exclusively around academic members of staff and um, they can you know proposals can include external collaborators okay so if you're interested to apply after coming to the webinar then you might want to get in touch with some of the research fellows themselves to discuss your idea they've got um, they'll, they'll be able to share their experiences of, of working on the, of the other projects that they've um, been involved with before and and explain to you about how they think they, that a particular project might work and they also think about the data resources that are available to you uh, for your particular project and make sure that the, that the ideas that you've got would be feasible to continue and to actually implement. Um, we have a, a, an expression of interest um, deadline which is the 4th of December and after that what we try to do is to set up a, a, a series of meetings where we meet with each of the applicants with the research fellows also there and we can have a just a very short chat about the project idea that you've got and think about the practicalities of it make sure the data is available and ask any questions that might help you to refine your question and think about um, how the data science application might be used to answer the question you're trying to answer um, the, dead, the deadline then for the full applications then is, is the 15th of January and then after that we would be reviewing the applications and the, the start date of the project would be sometime probably in March. So full details are on, on the website there. Um, the way that we assess them is that we obviously look at the quality of the of the um, of the actual projects and the novelty and ambition and timeliness of the work that you're proposing. 
the, the Zina needs to have that interdisciplinarity um, angle to it and alignment with the aims of IDSI. Um, we need to think about the proposed approach that you're thinking about for data science application and, and ensure that that does um, make sense to, to the people, like research fellows and, and other academics in IDSI. Um, and then thinking about also the potential that this, this particular project has got and what the possible impact could be and the knowledge exchange, exchange opportunities that it uh, offers. So if a project is funded, then we'll normally start off the the uh, project with a, a kickoff meeting where we'll start thinking about the um, the, the project itself and the uh, the start and end dates. And then we'll have a mid project review and then at the end, a final report, um, just a fairly short report. And what normally happens is that we'll then come back to those people um, periodically to see how the how the project has progressed. Sorry. Excuse me. Um, because one of the things we want to do is to see if we can get a, a view of what the impact has been from each of the different projects as time progresses. So we'll come back periodically to find out um, any more updates. And then sometimes we ask for um, academics to present their work at, at its events. <laughs> Excuse me. Italy. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. Probably a, a good time for me to take over, I think. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to talk you through an example project um, that I'm just coming to the end of uh, working on. Um, so in this particular project, it was proposed by uh, Dr. Victoria Stiles, who you may or may not know, and Matthew Ellison. So she's a um, senior lecturer in, bio, in, in biomechanics and he is a lecturer in health sciences. And when they came to us, they initially didn't have a sort of computer science project. Uh, uh, collaborator on this. So I think we put them in touch with uh, Federico Botta, who then provides oversight on the sort of data science side of things. Um, and the title of this project was, it's a bit of a mouthful, understanding the signal characteristics of accelerometry data that relates to bone loading events, pilot work for an inter interdisciplinary application. Um, so yeah, the project is about osteoporosis and what um, Dr. Stiles and Dr. Ellison bring to the team is an understanding of the um, sort of, yeah, the sports science and uh, biomechanics side of it. So they understand the osteoporosis and I don't know very much about it at all, um, but they share that wisdom with me and I can bring a little bit of data science in because they might not have the data, you know, data analysis or technical skills on that side of it to, um, to conduct the project. But the sort of the idea, the overview of this project is that osteoporosis is a is a disease of the bones uh, where your bones get weaker. And I can see there's lots of people from health science in this meeting. So you probably know this a lot, lot better than I do. But your bones get weaker over time, particularly as people get older. And one of the ways to prevent this, to prevent this weakening is through experiencing bone loading events, as they've been called here, which are impact forces uh, which trigger bone growth. So basically, if you don't experience a lot of impact if your bones don't you don't do much um then you over time your uh, your bones gradually weaken and um you can end up being more prone to breakages and more prone to uh yeah damage which quite often affects some uh, old people so if you can pop onto the next slide please for me emily yeah um so they came to us with some data that they've collected and what they're interested in is taking accelerometer data from a wrist worn device. So lots of people these days have things like smartwatches um, already on, on their person. And in those smartwatches, this is an example of the data on the left hand side. You have an accelerometer value for a three component trace. So an X, Y and Z direction. And you'll get this sort of signal out if somebody's been doing an activity. In this case, they are fast walking but in in the data set they sent me they had all sorts of different activities people were doing and then at the same time as that they had recorded some force data the force that is going through people's feet on a special treadmill with force plates involved and what they are ultimately looking to do is to be able to see if they can tell from the movements of the wrist from the acceleration of the wrist one device whether the participant whether the person wearing the the watch 
has experienced any significant impact in their legs, which would then help to stimulate strong bones in their legs and hip area where um, you're likely to experience uh, problems with osteoporosis. So this project is, and this is quite common with the projects that we deal with, quite speculative in its nature. When they came to us, they don't really know whether the information about the, um, about the impact to your legs is actually encoded in the wrist-worn device. They basically got some data, they're not sure what to do with it, um, and they came to us um, because they'd had a go at a couple of simple things. They tried um, sort of correlating the peaks in the amplitude of the uh, accelerometer data to the peaks in the amplitude of the force data. Um, but they'd done this in quite a labor intensive method where they were manually uh, annotating the data with uh, peak information. And um, and it was yeah labor intensive and, and didn't give them very much. So they wanted to know, firstly, what could we extract from it statistically that we could make some make some predictions about? And secondly, if there was anything further we could do with it uh, and could we get an idea of um, what what was going to be potentially possible? Uh, because what they really want to do from it is to um, is to uh, if I can prove the concept, then uh, they can use this as an application for more more complex testing equipment that can directly measure bone load. Um, could you go to the next slide, please, Emily? So, yeah, um, they wanted a validation of the concept and viability um, in order to uh, apply for future funding. And they wanted a pipeline for automated feature extraction from the accelerometer data. So you can see here that one of the things they wanted was finding these little yellow crosses, the little peaks in the force data. Um, and you kind of, and we want to find a model that can then predict the amplitudes of those peaks from the um, accelerometer trace signals. Um, yes, and if you can go to the next slide, please. So the outcomes we were able to get from this ultimately were we we proved the vi the viability of it um, there are a couple of problems with the way they'd collected data so we were able to make pretty decent predictions we could tell what activity somebody was doing and then roughly what um what the force they would experience uh, would be due to the activity that they're doing but we couldn't predict with the data they had um individual uh the 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 individual peaks for the individual strides and the activity we're doing. So if you're running, we, we couldn't go from one um, one step of accelerometer data to the exact peak in the, that step of the force data. But we were able to give them plenty of feedback and show them how they could better collect data in the future um, in order to be able to do that. And we've provided a pipeline for automatically segmenting the data into um, individual steps and normalizing those as, as vector inputs that could then be used in a more advanced convolutional, convolutional neural network approach than the statistical methods that they've been relying on. Um, with these recommendations, they were then able to put in an application for this uh, more complicated measurement system, which I gather is rather expensive, uh, where they measure strain on the bones directly. And uh, they were successful in that. And I'm now sort of helping them uh, take the, the work that we've done to segment strides and match them up to um, to their training data uh, into this sort of this new data type so that they can then um, use more complicated convolutional neural networks to to make these stride wise predictions rather than the statistical methods that they were doing before. So this is just an example of the kind of project we get. So you come to us with data and, amount, and an amount of uh, relative expertise to your field and we apply some data science expertise to sort of validate a concept or uh, provide some some um, yeah, some some value to your uh, future funding or something like that. Um, but we have worked with other projects. I've got other ones at the moment I'm working on identifying cancers in uh, in medical imaging. Um, yeah, I'm working on linguistic models and automatic analysis of uh, transcript data from interviews with people in psychology. So there's all sorts of data. This is just a single example, um, but it kind of give you, hopefully give you an idea of the scope of the projects. Thank you, Emily. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Finley. Um, and uh, yeah, sorry, um, I couldn't talk for a moment there. Can you see okay now? Um, my, yeah, I think my... Yep. Stop, stop sharing. Um, does anybody on the call have any questions about the 
program. Hello, Genevieve. Hi there. Thank you so much. And um, what a great example. I'm also a biomechanist, so I'm a bit biased, but Finia, it looks like you've done some really great work there. I just wondered, um, the, I guess, the state of the data. So in terms of how much data has been collected, are you expecting um, a kind of full data set or a pilot so we, grant? We, we like to have, at the outset of the project, we'd like to have all the data that you're going to have available um, to us. All too, uh, there have been experiences in the past where people say they're going to get data and then there's a delay and it delays the whole project. So we'd like you to have whatever you're going to have up front. But I would echo something that Emily said earlier, which is if you are unsure whether your data is suitable for the task you want to do, you can get in touch with myself, Charlie or Cedric by email and we'll happily come and talk to you. We'd much rather have an early conversation with you um, so that we can give you some input, particularly if it might affect the way that you then go on to collect data rather than have you, you you know you go at it blind and turn up with a bunch of stuff and hope for the best so so yeah we, we we want you to have all the data that you want to use by the time you submit your full application but if you've got any uncertainty or if you want to know some of the best practices for for collecting it then the sooner you talk to us the better as a, that last project is a really good example of that because they would have been able to do a lot more if they just had some way of correlating exactly which step in their acceleration data was correlated to exactly which step in their force data which they couldn't do and what it would have taken was somebody to do a, a little time like a, stamp what, sync a little yeah, time stamp exactly. yeah. yeah so so something like that with a little bit of early contact can help us make sure that the data we've got is as useful as possible i hope that Thanks. answers your question thank you So we have uh, another question in the chat um, from Matt about um, the longevity of the collaboration. So the, the fellows work on each different project for six months and they spend half of their time on it for that duration. So you're effectively getting three months of, of time, but spread over six months. I mean, beyond that point that um, they handed over back to the academic team again or beyond that. Um, there isn't any sort of allocated time beyond that. I mean, it, uh, what happens to the, um, hi there, Matt. Uh, what happens um, in practice is it, it depends on the project. I think some projects, there's a little bit more work to be done, say, to get a publication together. Um, and the research fellows can spend a, a bit of time on that, but they don't have dedicated time. So it's quite challenging to, to be able to spend, a, well, much time at all really on that. So there's much work, to get as much work done within the six months is, is way of doing it you think so about as, as an, that? As an, yeah i was going to say as i can as an example in that project at the moment they've gone on and got um they've slightly changed the data that they're using with their new application so i'm sort of finding time to to help them um on board the new data and stuff as well um uh, as and when i can i still have re regular contact with them but it's not uh, it's not part of my day-to-day -day anymore Thank you. Ollie? Hiya. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. really interesting stuff. Um, I was just wondering, so the, the kickoff meeting, is that to basically sort of streamline the idea? So going from sort of a general idea of something to look at to something more sort of concrete that can be sort of actually pursued in steps? Um, I think by the time we get to the kickoff kick meeting, we should have a plan already in place of what we want to do. I think probably the expression of interest is where you maybe outline what your idea is, and then we'll have interim meetings then with each of the different applicants. And that'd be the time when we could think about feasibility and maybe how you might possibly modify the approach that you're taking, um, depending on the availability of the data and that kind of thing. Um, and then you'd write your final application, your full application which would set out what your plan is. OK, so there's an expression of interest and then mm. there's a meeting and then the proposals. And then submitted. the full. Exactly. Yes, yes. OK, great. Thanks.
Any other questions? Finley, did you have any other points that you wanted to make? Um, I don't think so. No, I would. Uh, yeah, uh, the only further thing I was going to say was just yeah. If 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 in doubt, drop us a quick email with 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 your with your any specifics about your problem in and um and yeah, we'll be happy to give you feedback. Yeah. OK, well, if there's no more questions, then I guess that's um, probably the end of the, the webinar for this time. Um, but do get in touch if you've got any other questions, either with Finley or Cedric or Charlie or with, with me and Helen. Um, happy to answer your questions and to put you in touch with people. OK, thanks for attending. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much. Thanks, thank, thank you. you.